is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Red Rising Saga, Book Three, Morning Star, Chapters 11 through 14, My People, the Julii, and then Part Two, Rage, Howlers, and the Vampire Moon. In these chapters, our friends are hazed and I very nearly have a fucking heart attack. How about we don't haze people like this when they have just been traumatized? Just a thought. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Cassie for commissioning this episode. Cassie is here in the chat. Thank you for joining me, Cassie, and commissioning this. Um, Y'all, there's other things that happen first that I, I will talk about. But can we just have a moment? I need a show of hands for who freaked out thinking that our guys had got got when they got jumped right out of the shower. I swear to God, it's like, that's the last, that's how Darrow got got a previous time was that he was naked having just been bathing. So why, why do you, why do you, why are you going to do it? Why don't stop it? Can they just enjoy anything without having to be on guard, without having to worry for a fucking week at a time after this? I am so irritated. I really am. <sighs> okay. So let's, 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 let's start at the beginning. It turns out that Darrow, in response to finding out Severo had leaked the footage of his carving, just got up and left. And I can't help but understand that. He thinks about how, like, doing it was sort of childish, or like, you know, the response to it. But honestly, I think he gets to be childish. I feel like if we're being real about the way this would all have gone down were Darrow a real person... There is no way he would be as functional as he is, all things considered. Nine months of torture is a long time. And he has only been here for like two days. And he is having a real, I can't be what these people need kind of moment. And it's so interesting to me because what has happened, and this actually may work to his benefit, and I'm going to try and like articulate how I'm feeling here. Darrow, in the previous two books, for the first half of the first book, he was a red. Not even half. And then... He becomes a gold who's sort of bottom tier, but manages to gain a lot of respect and wind up sort of on top of the world. And then as we go into the next book, he gets bumped down again, but picks himself up and is essentially a god to the golds for like two thirds of the book. And I don't mean all the golds, but you get what I'm saying. And then he suffers this horrific torture, this setback to the cause, loss of a leader, everything, just as his identity is leaked as a red. And I can't help but think that that is all to the good in terms of the timing of it. Because Darrow's having been a gold and a, a save, not a savior, but a 
sort of um, uh, ideal for the Golds, I don't feel like that would play very well for the other colors. I feel like he is trying, he would be trying to sort of represent them, but if they didn't know where he originally came from, they couldn't quite trust him. And they would see his, his sort of like, the air that Darrow gave off a lot of the time was one of a person who is immortal and untouchable, which is granted the way that golds are meant to sort of function anyway, but he had taken it to another level because of what his goal was. And even though we know that he was scared when we are inside his head, I believe that he manages to really project a sense of control at all times, you know? So I can't help but think that he's transitioning into another stage of his campaign, if that makes sense. And the kind of shit that he has gone through, considering what so many other low colors have gone through is only going to make him more relatable to them. Setting aside the fact that he is originally a red. I feel like that I understand why Severo did it. And I think it will, it works out for Darrow in the big picture. But even if that information had not been leaked, Part of me feels that Darrow's trauma is such that it gives a different dimension to his approach to everything in a way that's really necessary for people of low colors who have gotten through some grim life experiences can actually respect and believe that he understands some of where they're coming from. Because even having been a red, he was very young. And so there are things that he hadn't experienced yet in terms of, you know, the, the ongoing toil and seeing things happen to family members. Like he was, he suffered tragedy for sure, but there's a different feel to something happening when you're very young. And what happens when the hope has been beaten out of you over the course of time. You know, you suffer a loss like Darrow did and, and his despair and wanting to end his own life. There is still a sort of that a passion behind that despair, but the type of despair as a low color of just everyday life and no end in sight. I think a lot of us are feeling that lately, you know, the past decade or so has really been a particularly bad one. And somebody as young as him, it would be really difficult for me to believe that he understood where I was coming from with some of what I've gone through and what my priorities are and the way that I have changed my perspective and priorities for the, the cause based on that. So he this opens with him just being like, I'm looking down and I see them, but they're they're They want more than I can give. Basically. Um, they don't understand that we can't win this war. Aries even knew we could never go toe to toe with gold. So how am I supposed to lift them up and to show them the way I'm afraid, not just that I can't give them what they want, but that by releasing the truth, Severo's burned the boat behind us. There's no going back for us. Behind me, Ragnar moves past my wheelchair and slides down next to me. And uh, this is when he has the, a, a sort of nice heart to heart. And he talks about how as boys, they used to like basically play a game where they would fuck around with maybe getting bit by a pit viper. And, he used to be able to stand in front of that wall longer than anybody. And now he couldn't last even a minute. Um, And Ragnar says, because you know now how much there is to lose. And that's the thing that I think tempers so many people as they get older is, you know, it's very, very tempting, even for me at this stage 
to think about the optimism that I had at one point and the tireless sort of idealism and how it's gone. And there's a part of me that feels like I'm flawed because I can't sustain that anymore. But there's also just the reality of understanding in a way that you can't, you literally cannot when you are younger, what the oppressive group is capable of and how many times people have a, like when you're young, you think everything is like every idea you come up with is new and that nobody's ever done it before. A lot of the time, like you really think that you're suggesting something that hasn't been considered. And then as you get older and begin to learn about the history of how things have worked and the ways that different events shaped the situation we are currently in, you begin to understand lots of good, smart people attempted to make major changes. It's not that nobody's ever tried. It's that the machine is so efficient at crushing that, that you would need a kind of groundswell that's unheard of, you know? And it can be really, really difficult, especially nowadays. It's so strange the way that having access to more information and communication with more people has somehow fractured us even more. And it, that's it, that's like a double-edged sword of the internet. That's how that works. But I think sometimes about what if we all, everybody who made like under a certain amount of money a year just decided to go on strike. What if we all just agreed? No, you know what? Fuck this. Things would change in the matter of days. You know, it would be, everything would grind so utterly to a halt. But how do you get even 40% on board? 40% would be unbelievable. And yet, I don't see how we manage to get everybody who really should have a stake in the way things are going to care and believe enough to risk things like that. And that's where I start to get really beaten down feeling. Um, so anyway, this is when, and I, this got me guys, this really did. Darrow says, I don't feel her anymore, Ragnar. I know they think I'm their link to her, but I lost her in the darkness. I used to think she was watching me. I used to talk to her. Now she's a stranger. So much of this is my fault, Ragnar. If I hadn't been so proud, I would have seen the signs. Fitchner would be alive. Lorne would be alive. You think you know the strands of fate? He laughs at my arrogance. You do not know what would have happened if they lived. I know I can't be what these people need. He frowns. And how would you know what they need when you are afraid of them, when you can't even look upon them? And he says, come with me. And they go to one of the hospitals. Um, this is a really great moment. And it it's interesting how much it sort of mirrors a moment in mocking Jay as well, because it's when mock when is it in no mocking Jay? Yeah, it's in mocking Jay. Um, Katniss is at a place where she's been through so much that she is really beginning to sort of lose sight of what it's all for. And she gets brought to meet people in a hospital and it kind of, there's, it jolts her a little bit somehow, you know, and that goes much more poorly than this goes. <laughs> I'll say that. But, um, I really enjoy this interaction that Darrow has with this guy, Vano, 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 um, who has lost his legs. And there is just a lot of back and forth and a lot of like Darrow dropping back into the, the red slang and mindset even so that he can, I don't, I don't want to say prove that he was really, because like that's, he, he has nothing to prove really at this point, but he has 
to be reminded, I think, where he comes from in a a bigger way than just visiting as a gold. It visiting in the stage that he was in when he was at Lycos, the mindset is just he was so, so apart from it all still. And what's happened has brought him back down a little bit. Um, so eventually somebody is like, ask him, ask him. And it turns out they want to know whether or not he got to keep the dick he had or if he got one made that's proportional to his new body. And he says, you really want to know? Ivano says, I mean, not for personal reasons, but I've got money riding on it. And Darrow says, well, I lean forward seriously. So do Vano and his bedmates nearby. If you really want to know, you should ask your mother. (laughs) That was such such a good answer. Oh my God. I love it so much. I like to think that this author like hangs around in spaces where his books are being discussed by fans and somebody just bodily was like, Hey, did he get a new dick though? What do you think? And joked around about it. And the author was like, Ooh, interesting question. Maybe I'll have somebody ask that. You know what I mean? Like I just, Oh, that is very, very funny. And it really works. Like things have been kind of tense and not unfriendly, but just tense. And when he makes this joke, the whole vibe changes in the place. Um, It fills me with energy to see the shifting tide and realize it's because of a single laugh. Instead of retreating from the eyes from the room, I move away from Ragnar down the line of cots to mingle more with the injured, to thank them, to ask where they're from and learn their names. And this is where I thank Jove. I have a good memory on me. Forget a man's name and he'll forgive you. Remember it and he'll defend you forever. I just want to say how much I envy people who can remember names. I am so bad at it. If it's in a group on the internet and I can see it written down. It helps so much. I I tend to remember a lot better, but God help me. If we are in person, I am so sorry. If anybody out there listening has been like, yeah, I know you forgot mine. It's not personal. It's not even that I wasn't paying attention when you told me it's, it's just like it slides right off of the surface of my brain not because it's unimportant, but because my when I am in a social situation, my brain is so busy processing a million other cues and signals because I have so much anxiety that it crowds out crucial shit like your fucking name. And that really is how anxiety f- works. Like, it just takes up so much goddamn RAM that real shit falls to the sidelines like it's nothing, which is ironic because allegedly anxiety is here to help. It wants me to be prepared, but it doesn't help. It just fills the room and ruins everything. So anyway, (laughs) most call me Sir or Reaper, and I want to correct them and tell them to call me Darrow. But I know the value of respect, of distance between men and leader, because even though I'm laughing with them, even though they're helping heal what's been twisted inside me, they are not my friends. They are not my family. Not yet. Not until we have that luxury. For now, they are my soldiers and they need me as much as I need them. I'm their reaper. It took Ragnar to remind me. He favors me with an ungainly grin, so pleased to see me smiling and laughing with the soldiers. I've never been a man of joy, or a man of war, or an island in a storm, never an absolute like Lorne. That was what I pretended to be. I am, and always have been, a man who is made complete by those around him. And 
I just love this so much. Just the, I feel my soul trickling back into me. What a great line, you know, it's, it's, I feel that I really do. So, uh, he goes back to his friends and apologizes for his reaction to the news. Um, I may not be what I was before the darkness, but perhaps I'm better for it. I have humility I didn't have before. Pre- well, more than that, but yes. Um, and this is when he says, I know that you didn't expect me to be back like this, but I am different. I can't help you this way. So I need you to do three things. Send an emissary to Mustang. I know you think she betrayed me, but I want her to know I'm alive. Severo says, we already gave her the opportunity once. She almost killed you and Rags. But she did not, Ragnar says. I'm really curious about this, guys, because him saying, like, I know you think she betrayed me. I thought that we knew that it was Harmony. Why do they still think that Mustang betrayed him? When, I mean, shit was already in motion by the time he told her. If so, if the jackal had found out about Dara when he had Harmony in his clutches, so I don't really get where why there's still that kind of suspicion on her. I mean, I understand that since she hasn't like been working with them the way that she had been, that's basically amounting to her sort of turning her back on their cause. But I don't know if that's the same as a betrayal. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so Ragnar is like, I will go as emissary. And Severo says, like hell, you'll, you're one of the most wanted men in the system. We'll send one of my spies, Theodora says. I have one in mind. She's good and 100 kil- kilograms less conspicuous than you, Prince of the Spires. Um, and it turns out that it is Evie. She's done her best to make amends for the sins of the past, even ones that weren't hers. I'm glad Evie's still around. And I'm glad that she's not apparently working with fucking Harmony. Because that was a bad scene, you know? I need you to bring Mickey back to Tinos. I need him to make me into a weapon again. Several cackles. Now we're talking. Dancer shakes his head. Mickey's half a thousand clicks away, working on his little project he's needed there. You need calories, not a carver. In the state you're in, it could be dangerous. And I sort of was thinking the exact same thing. Is like, you've just been starved. They can't just graft new muscle onto you, can they? I mean, maybe they can. I don't know. Maybe they fucking can. But considering everything that they're capable of, it's likely. But I, I do think that, like restoring the muscle that you had is likely to be a a, like faster recovery period than coming back from the level of surgery he would need. Um, but yeah, Severo says we can get Mickey and his equipment here by Thursday. Virini has been consulting with him anyway about your condition. He'll be tickled pink to see you. Dancer watches Severo with strained patience. And the last request I grimace. I have a feeling you're not going to like this one. And the next chapter, we start with him going to see Victra. This conversation is great. I really find it so cathartic in a way because of her being the only other person that was on his side that was there for what happened and them managing to connect because other the, I don't know how I don't know if anybody else can possibly get what it was like and how completely blindsided Darrow was um but they're watching or Victra is watching uh Roke on the TV with his mother And she's giving some speech about like Roke always liked the natural world more than cities, how it formed effortlessly into a hierarchy. I think that's why he loved the society so dearly. Even then, that woman would look much better with a gun in her mouth, Victor mutters. 
She's probably said his name more in the last month than she did his entire childhood, I reply. Well, politicians never let a popular family member go to waste. And, uh, I mean, that is very literally what's happening here. I'm not blaming either of them for this because that's just fucking facts. Um, so she's like, are you in charge? And Darrow says, no, Severo is. I fucked up. So he's the one. And she's sort of like, I mean, I guess that makes sense. But I don't know. First time I saw him, he was kicking, kicking Tactus's ass. He always had a bigger bite than bark, which is a really great way to say that. I don't feel like I've ever heard it in reverse like that. So he starts to like apologize and explain. And she's like, can we just skip it? And in summary, she's just, it makes sense that you would rise up. Like, yeah, I get it. And he had been expecting her to just be a lot more, if not necessarily resentful, maybe just indignant. You know, I can't believe you didn't tell me. But she is, I can't believe you didn't tell me. It's just got a really, really different vibe to it than you would expect. Um, and she says, like, first of all, why did you save me? It's because you're my friend. Oh, please. I would rather have died trying to get you out of that cell than let you rot there. And she really doesn't seem to believe him. Then, why would I care about what you were? I care about peop what people do. I care about truth. If you had told me, I wouldn't have done a single thing differently. I would have protected you. I believe her, and I believe the pain in her eyes. Why didn't you tell me? Because I was afraid. But I wager you told Mustang. Yes. Why her and not me? I at least deserve that. I don't know. It's because you're a liar. You said I wasn't wicked in the hall, but you think it deep down. You never trusted me. No, I said. I didn't. That's my mistake. And my friends have paid for it with their lives. That guilt was my only company in the box he kept me in for nine months. But now I've been given a second chance at life and I don't want to waste it. I want to make amends with you. I owe you a life. I owe you justice and I want you to join us. So that was the deal. It was like, we're going to make her one of the sons of Aries. I love that she called him out like that because she's absolutely right. He didn't quite trust her. And granted, because of the way this world works, I tend to have my suspicions of practically everybody at any given time, but I really didn't have them about Victor for very long. Occasionally there'd be a little flutter, but even at like when everything was going down at the end of the last book, I had a brief moment where I was like, Oh my God, does Victor know? Did she, was she in on it? And even as I was wondering it, I was thinking, no, I don't, I don't see it. That doesn't, unless she was able to completely pretend to be another person. And mostly in these books, nobody is pretending to be someone they're not. It's simply that things shift in a way that you have to keep track of to find out where their priorities might be based on what circumstances currently are. But there's never been anybody who has just faked being an ally. Really? Like the Jackal didn't even really fake it. He was pretty straightforward about you're not going to want to trust me. And Darrow claimed he didn't trust him, even though he did. All of it was just very much in character for the Jackal that we know. So as much as it came as a shock that this had all happened, it wasn't a shock that he turned on Darrow. That wasn't the part that was surprising. So this moment with her just being like, you fucking said, and then you acted in a way that says you didn't believe that at all. Especially for somebody like Victor, who clearly struggles with being her authentic self because of the way she was raised and how unwelcome that tends to be. I can see why that would bother her so much. 
especially because she clearly like cares about Darrow. And as I, I was sort of wondering, is there going to be any flicker of like when he sees her after what they've gone through, that they now maybe have more of a romantic potential than they did before because currently Mustang's out of the picture and they're both, they've both been traumatized by the same person, but there's nothing like that in this scene. I don't see that suggested at all. And he even thinks about the fact that he feels so differently toward her than he does toward Mustang and how if things were different, then maybe they would have that fire between them, but they just don't, you know? Um, so basically what she says is you want to know what I want. I want to fucking fuck everybody up who did this to me. I want vengeance on every one of their asses. And he tries to say at first, revenge is a hollow end. And she says, and I'm a hollow girl. And instead of arguing, and I was really worried he would, he's just like, you know what? Eventually, she's going to change her mind about what she wants. So I'll let this go for now because she needs to heal and realize that's not really what she wants. And a part of me was like, correct. Absolutely. Great call. And another part of me was like, yeah, but see, Darrow, here's the thing again, is you like making a call when you directly asked her what she wanted and you told her, you're like, okay, yeah, I'll let you have that. But in your heart, you're kind of like, but no, not really. You, you're, it's, and it's not a lie. I really think that he's right about the fact that she'll probably get to a point where she, that's no longer her main priority. But I wish... In, I wish that he trusted her more and just, you know what I mean? And just let it be what it is. Um. So yeah, he says in three days, the carver who made me into a gold will be here. He will make us what we were. He'll mend your spine, give you your legs back if you want them. And you trust me after what trust has cost you. You're dumber than you look <laughs> after he frees her. I love it so much. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to find the spot where he does his like, I've seen myself change. I truly do believe we choose who we want to be in this life. It isn't preordained. You taught me loyalty more than Mustang, more than Roke. And because of that, I believe in you, Victra, as much as I've ever believed in anyone. Be my family and I will never forsake you. I will never lie to you. I will be your brother as long as you live. Startled by the emotion in my voice, the cold woman stares up at me. Those defenses she erected forgotten now. In another life, we might have been a pair, might have had that fire I feel for Mustang, for Eo, but not in this life. Victra does not soften, does not crumble to tears. There's still rage inside her, still raw hate, and so much betrayal and frustration and loss coiled around her icy heart. But in this moment... She is free of it all. In this moment, she reaches solemnly up to grasp my hand, and I feel the hope flicker in me. Welcome to the Sons of Ares. So, chapter 13. We start off with them in the weight room, doing some training together. And, uh, you guys, the two of them, like, after everything that they've done just managing to get back up and do like a, th sorry, there's a bug in here, uh, a 300 kilo bench press. Jesus fucking Christ. Why, why can't we just have this technology, please? Ugh. I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> so she, she says, what's a girl got to do to get a wolf cloak? I shot a legget in the head two missions ago. I've seen your howlers. Aside from Ragnar, they're tiny. They need more heavies. And uh, I love how this is like coming up. And I don't know if Darrow has any idea that this is coming. I feel like he's caught completely by surprise. But um, the it says the Ramsackle Gymnasium has been our second home since Mickey carved us. It was weeks of recovery in his ward as her nerves remembered how to walk. And both of us tried to put on weight under the supervision of Dr. Virini. 
So weeks of recovery, but apparently the recovery would have been even slower than that if he had just tried to like start eating again and slowly increasing his exercise, which I guess makes sense. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to just take his word for it. Um, Ragnar came in to embarrass us a couple weeks back, just started piling weights onto a barbell till no more would fit. Power cleaned it and then gestured for us to do the same. Victor couldn't even get the weight off the ground. I got as far as my knees. Then we had to listen to the hundred idiots who flocked after him chant his name for an hour, which is truly hysterical. And guys, there is a, a TikTok account where this guy, <laughs> it's really really funny. This guy is a professional weightlifter, bodybuilder, and he is still, despite that, rather spare looking. He doesn't have the kind of bulk that you associate with that. And so because he can, can almost look skinny in the right clothing, he'll go into gyms and dress up as an old man. Like he'll put like a, a white beard on and wear like orthopedic style shoes and just really make himself look like he's in his mid sixties minimum and potter around with like a bucket and rag as if he's cleaning the equipment. But then somebody will like walk away from a station and they'll have left the weights on the barbell and he'll just lift it up over his head and then mop underneath it with the rag and then put it back down and does it with like the one hand and the camera follows him. So you get to see the person in the background just draw jaw drop because this old man has just fucking like clean and jerked a, a 175 pounds. And they're like, what the fuck? And he has done it so many. It's really, really enjoyable to just see the way that they underestimate him. And these these dudes who are about to do like deadlifts of 400 pounds sort of gesturing when he's like, can I try it with a kind of smirk on their face? Because they clearly can't wait to see him do his best. And then when he actually manages to not only do the deadlift, but then do like multiple reps, they almost look sometimes not angry. Isn't the right word, but like they feel like they've been made the fool of, and he was supposed to be the one that got made a fool of and what the fuck. And, that's just what this reminded me of. It was very funny to me. Um, regaining our sense in the field has taken just as long. We started with baby steps. Um, 10 supply runs, two sabotage missions, three assassinations later, Severo's finally convinced that Holiday, Victor, and I are ready to run with the B squad, the Pit Vipers, led by my own Uncle Nero. And I love that they're called Pit Vipers. What a great name. Um who has be become a bit of a cult hero to the Reds here. Ragnar's a godlike creature, but my uncle is just a rough old man who drinks too much, smokes too much, and is uncommonly good at war. And uh, the, the vibe here, as he describes all of this, is the fact that it feels like they're really spinning their tires and not getting anywhere. And mentions that he feels like a terrorist, because of the way that this is all having to be carried out. And I thought that was very interesting. The fact that like this propaganda that's being circulated about like how terrible they are, even if your cause has never changed, if the method that you have to employ is different, how it'll change the way you see yourself. And also knowing that, people out there are walking around with the wrong idea about you. It's very easy to be like, don't worry about what other people think, but that's just not human nature. Of course we worry about what other people think. And even if you know that what you're doing doesn't quite fit the category that they think it can be really tough to like shake that in your head. Every time you do anything that you're kind of playing into that, that, assumption everybody is making, you know, I think all of us can have this happen. Um, so just the fact that it's sort of getting to him, I thought was really interesting and very human and understandable. Um, <laughs> Victor seems to have moved past. Uh, oh, right, right, right. 
I wish more were like her. I wish I felt less and was less afraid. But as I recall that ribbon of smoke, all I can think is that it presages something worse, as if the universe is showing us glimpses of the end we're rushing toward. Um, because yeah, he, the, the I forgot, I kind of skipped over this. There's so much that I intend to sort of gloss over so I can get to a thing, but then it's like important enough that I feel like I have to talk about it and backtrack. Um, so earlier this week, the Pit Vipers and I were dispatched from the tunnels to the northern continent of Arabia, Arabia Terra, where the Red Legion had carved themselves a stronghold in the port city of Izminia. It was Dancer's hope I could bring them into the fold in a way Severo hadn't been able to. But instead of finding allies, we found a mass grave, a gray, bombed out city shelled from orbit. I can still see that pale, bloated mass of bodies writhing on the coastline. Crabs skittering over the corpses, making meals of the dead as a lone ribbon of smoke twirled and twirled up to the stars. So, yeah, that's, uh, they, you know, from trauma to trauma, that's really what it is here. Um, so it turns out that his mom really doesn't like Victra. Uh, she'll always hate me. Well, you could try being more polite. I'm perfectly polite, Victor says in offense. And I can't tell if she is or not. I don't know whether to trust her judgment on that. I feel like probably if he's saying you could be a bit more polite and she doesn't think she's being impolite, then it might be like a, a, a what do you call it? Like a cultural gap that she is being polite in the way that she knows how, but that doesn't match up with what Reds expect. But I don't know. And this is when he gets out of the shower and he finds her naked on the floor, hands and legs hogtied behind her back. What an incredibly like awful way to be tied up when naked. That's just something that I cannot help but associate with like BDSM. So the the sexualization of that moment, I was just like, Jesus Christ, guys. Um, but yeah, he fights and, you know, there's one person that he has their head between his thighs. All I need to do is twist and his neck breaks, but two more sets of hands are on me. And I was like, after it's revealed who's here, he killed one of his own people. Did that happen? I feel like there has to be a better way to do this. Like, really? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, you guys. I just feel like that doesn't, you know, you're inducting people, but you're also losing people and they're friends with each other. And isn't that going to sort of throw a damper on things? I don't know. Maybe I misread it. It sounds like all I need to do is twist and his neck breaks but two more sets of hands are on me. So it sounds like he, he d does the breaking. He doesn't say all I need to do is twist and his neck will break. He doesn't say like, here's what could happen. He says, all I need to do is twist and his neck breaks. And it sounds very present. Like that's what has happened. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so, oh, sorry, in the chat, uh, Ashley says, Victor's brutal honesty is part of what makes her one of my absolute faves of the series. Definitely get it. He was pulled away before he could kill him. Cassie says, I think he's saying he could have just twisted and he would die, but he didn't. Okay, it's not written clearly enough, in my opinion. That sound, all I need to do is twist and his neck breaks. It sounds very much like he killed him to me. And I just wish that that was just a little bit clearer. <laughs> um, but anyway, so somebody says, get him on their bloody damn knees. And as soon as he realizes, oh, bloody damn. Oh, fucking K. It's Severo and they're about to be hazed. And this is so fucking awful. <laughs> So I can't believe that Ragnar says to Victra, do not profane this moment when what they are forced to do is the profanity. Ragnar, it's, it's a profane right. I'm sorry, but it is. 
Uh, as the rules set forth in our sacred text, you must be purged of your former oaths and prove your worth before you can take our vows. So let the purge begin. Music thumps from somewhere. I kind of was wondering if Victor was going to have a reaction to that, but she doesn't. And I can't tell how much I am relieved that we don't have those sorts of like triggers with our characters but and i but i also am like kind of bummed out that it doesn't seem to be a factor at all i don't know i don't know um the howlers rush forward bottles are brought to our lips and we chug as they chant around some weird looping melody that several leads with body aplomb ragnar roars with satisfaction when i bring the bottle they bring me when I finish the bottle they bring me, I almost puke then and there. The liquor burns, scouring my esophagus and belly. So I'm assuming that they have to drink a whole, like, bottle of vodka or something, which would literally kill me. I have to assume I would actually die. That's just, that's just facts for me. I do not handle liquor well at all. It would be very bad. And then Ragnar says, bring forth the snake's and cockroaches. And I thought this was a metaphor. I thought this was going to be like, oh, we're putting the fear of God into you saying it's snakes and cockroaches. And then they bring out something that's like, I see why you call it that, but it's not literally that. No, it's literally that. That's what it is. And I should mention, Holiday is part of this. So she did survive and she's you know, getting into fighting shape again. And Holiday is very much more with the program than Darrow or Victra. So she manages to finish the bottle as well. And then and Victra's the one who really has trouble with it. And then as soon as they bring out this bucket with the pit viper and cockroaches, she reaches inside, grabs the snake, slams it on the floor till it dies, and then just takes a bite out of it immediately she knows exactly what the fuck is going on here and evidently because i was like sort of thinking they were each going to get a snake and then they were each going to get cockroaches but evidently there's one snake and then cockroaches so she saw it and instantly is like oh fuck me i'm not eating cockroaches so and i have to say right call correct call like, I the, the fact that they have to eat these cockroaches, you guys, the vomiting, of course, the vomiting for me would come before I ate anything. It would just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I'm so sorry. I am a wuss and a cream puff. I am. And I would literally rather die than drink a bottle of vodka and then chew a bunch of fucking cockroaches. That is all there is to it. Throw me out the airlock and be fucking done with it. Because I have zero fucking interest. Nah, nah. It's the sort of thing that I feel like even once it's over and done, it would haunt me for the rest of my mind, my life in my mind. And I would just have like intrusive thoughts about it. And I would never escape it. This moment would just be like, you know, ugh. <gasps> He says, to his credit, I'm almost crying. Victra is gagging at the sight of me. I swallow it down and grab her hand and force it into the bucket. She makes a sudden lurching movement, and I'm too slow to realize what it means. Her vomit splashes onto my shoulder. At the smell of it, I can't hold my own in. Holiday chews on. Ragnar shouts her praises. By the time we finish the bucket, we're a huddled, pathetic mass of drunk, bug-and-guts-covered filth. <laughs> this is our sacred text my little friend is saying you will study this sacred text soon you will know this sacred text inside and out but today you need only know howler rule one never bow i am desperate to find out what the sacred text is i feel like it's going to be something like the fucking kama sutra like he's just going to pick something profane and been like ha it's our sacred text because later on we find out that one of the the uh wh where is it well actually it's going to it's a little bit further on but um <laughs> Cassie says yeah like never be able to eat fried food again right 
Ashley says, if you were very lucky, the alcohol would delete the memory. Maybe. Maybe. Ow. Maybe. I want to believe that. It's the sort of thing where it's it could go either way. Sometimes things will get fixed more in your memory because of like the frantic alcohol induced haze, but it can go either way. So the question is, would you be willing to bet on it? Um, so Nerol comes in at this point, turns on the lights and just throws a bit of cold water over what they're doing. The howlers look at the ludicrousness of one another awkwardly. We're performing a secret occult ritual, Severo says, and you are interrupting subordinate. Right, Nerol says, nodding, a little disturbed. Sorry, sir. When I tell you I was shocked, I did not think he was going to like actually be like, oh, you're right. I am a subordinate. He is. But I really thought he was going to just be like, listen here, you little shit. And he doesn't. And I mean, that's why that's how an army has to work. Like, really? But I was. There was something unnerving about realizing Severo has real power, like genuine power in a way that feels mostly like a joke a lot of the time. Just the, this reminder, I was sort of like, oh, God. Um, one of our pinks stole a data pad from a bone rider in a Gia. Bone rider. Lol. We found out who he is. No shit. Was I right? Who? The Jackal's silent partner. It's Quicksilver. You were right, Severo. Our agents say he's at corporate headquarters on Phobos, but he won't be for long. I don't remember who Quicksilver is. I feel like this was said in a way that I was supposed to get who it is. And I don't recall. And I'm so sorry. But I just, just being straight up with you guys. Um, he's bound for Luna in two days and we won't be able to touch him there. So Operation Black Market it's a, is a go. It's a go. Dancer admits reluctantly. Hell yeah. You heard the man howlers. Get scrubbed, get sober, get fed. We've got a silver to kidnap and an economy to trash. It's going to be a hell of a day. And I was like, oh, God, what does this even look like? The fact that he's so excited about it, I feel, has to be a bad sign. Um, so they go to – it's uh, the largest of the moons of Mars. Um Formed long before the age of man, when a meteorite struck Father Mars and flung debris into orbit, the oblong moon floated like a cast-off corpse, dead and abandoned for a billion years. Now it is the hive, teeming with the parasitic life that pumps blood into the veins of the gold empire. Swarms of tiny, fat-bodied cargo ships rise from Mars' surface to funnel into the two huge gray docks that encircle the moon. There, they transfer the bounty of Mars to the kilometer-long Cosmo haulers that will bear the treasure along the great Julii Agos trade routes to the rim, or more likely to the core, where hungry Luna waits to be fed. And I'm not going to get into all of the descriptions of this place because I'm running out of time here. But he calls it the largest pin cushion man has ever built. And I feel like that really gets to the heart of what we're describing here. Um, looks larger when you're not on the bridge of a torch ship. Victor draws from behind me being disenfranchised is so damn tedious. <laughs> what a line it is though, girl. I mean, fuck. Um, in the aftermath of my escape, the Jackal initiated an immediate moratorium on all flights leaving Mars for orbit. He suspected the Suns would make a desperate bid to get me off planet. Fortunately, Severo isn't a fool. If he had been, I'd likely be in the Jackal's hands. Ultimately, not even the Arch Governor of Mars could ground all commerce for long, and so his moratorium was short lived. But the shock waves it sent through the markets were staggering. Billions of credits lost every minute the Helium-3 did not flow. Severo found it rather inspiring. Yeah! Oh my god. Ashley is in the chat saying, My crowdcast is glitching and it's just Natasha saying fuck on repeat. God, I've never felt more seen. <laughs> 
Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Focus, focus. Um, so, uh, my eyes seek the silver winged heel icon that is stamped on the greatest of Phobos towers, a three kilometer long double helix of steel and glass tipped with a silver crescent. 30 million people. I whisper, you don't agree with Severo's plan. Do you? Severo kept the sons alive. I didn't. So I'll follow his lead. Mm hmm. I wonder when you started believing grit and vision were the same thing. And I really can't decide. I feel like I feel like I want Darrow to put his foot down with Severo a little bit. I almost feel like that's what Severo wants. There's a part of me that sees Severo as a kid who pushes the envelope wanting his parent to tell him to stop. You know what I'm saying? And trying to see what he can get away with, not because he even enjoys the thing, but because he is looking for a person to guide him and be a leader. So there's, I, I kind of almost want Darrow to like push it a little bit and be like, no, you know what? We're not fucking doing this. But I just, I understand how out of sorts he is because of everything and how how much has been done to him and how much has happened in general and how much he wasn't around for and just the fact that the landscape has shifted so much since he has been out and about with everybody the problem is he has been working on missions for weeks and we just didn't see that time pass so this does feel a little bit faster than i know it actually is because that all was taken care of in a couple sentences, you know, but I don't know. I just don't, I, I am not sure he should let Severo get his way on this, but what can you do? Um, so they have to, you know, do a whole thing where, uh, they bribe blues to let them smuggle one of the containers into a certain place and yada, yada, yada. Um, I noticed the others listening, so I nod and shut my mouth. It's ten minutes later. We hear a solitary pair of feet click against the de the deck outside. What can never die? Severo growls in his best obsidian accent. The fungus under airy sack. The man smiles. That's the call sign. You know, I'm not. I'm not apologizing for thinking that their sacred text might just be the Kama Sutra. I just feel like. Your own, your own brand is so strong. You really have nobody but yourself to blame for that. Um, our contact goes by the name of Rolo, stringy and wry, and wry with sparkling bright eyes and an easy way with the women, even though he brings up his wife, the most beautiful woman who has apparently ever walked the surface of Mars at least twice a minute. He also hasn't seen her in eight years. He spent that time on the hive as a welder on the space towers. Uh, Severo says mighty full of himself and Victor says, I rather like his goatee. The blues call this place the hive, Rolo's saying. Um, meat, uh, meat goes out. It's just a grinder. Tower goes up, meat goes out. And this is just sort of an, uh, the way that this works out with the conversation that he has. Um, Ragnar hesitates, eyes lingering on an anti-terrorism poster pasted onto a concrete support. See something, say something, it reads, showing a pale red with evil crimson eyes and the stereotypical tattered dress of a miner skulking near a door that says restricted access. Can't see the rest. It's covered in rebel graffiti. But then I realize Ragnar's not looking at the poster, but at the man I didn't even notice who's crumpled on the ground beneath it. His hood's up, left leg is an ancient mech replacement. A crusted brown bandage covers half his face. There's a puff, the release of pressurized gas, and the man leans back from us, shivering and smiling with perfectly black teeth. A plastic stim cartridge clatters to the floor. Tar dust. Why do you not help these people? Ragnar asks. Help them with what? Brother, we barely got enough for flesh and kin. No good sharing with that lot, you know. But that one is red. They are your family. 
Rolo frowns at the bare truth. Save the pity, Ragnar, Victor says. That syndicate crank he's puffing. Most of them would slit your throat for an afternoon high, their empty flesh. Empty what? I say, turning back to her. She's caught off guard by the sharpness of my tone, but she's loath to back off, so she doubles down, instinctively. Empty flesh, darling. Part of being human is having dignity. They don't. They carved it out themselves. That was their choice, not gold's. Even if it's easy to blame them for everything, so why should they deserve my pity? And they have a, a real... I really, really liked this, even though it's sort of like the basics, you know, like drug addiction 101 sort of shit. The thing about people affected by addiction is that they tend to be those with the fewest prospects and the most set against them a lot of the time, whether that be economically or emotionally or whatever. And she finds out not only that they have as like indentured servants, they have to also pay for their transit. She's so shocked by this. She thought that was something that was just sort of included and is realizing like, that's not how this works. Um, company doesn't cover it. Should have read the fine print. Sure. It was my choice to come up here it was theirs too. But when the only other choice is starving, these slags just got unlucky on the job. Lost legs, arms. Company doesn't cover prosthetics, at least not decent ones. What about carvers? I ask. He scoffs. And who the hell do you know that can afford flesh work? I didn't even think of the cost. Reminds me of how distant I am from so many of the people I claim to fight for. Here's a red, one of my own, more or less, and I don't even know what type of food is popular in his culture. And when she asks... What company do you work for? He says, Julii Industries. And it just cuts. And then we go to another section of the chapter and she's just sitting there thinking. See, this is the shit. And there's a lot of this sort of thing with, and, and I feel like it makes sense. When there are characters who are sort of from a privileged background and they are very flip about the condition of an oppressed group, but you want them to be like a good one you know, a, a good oppressor, you have them meet those they're oppressing and not know really the extent of things. And it can feel overly simplistic because it's sort of like, how could you not know? But the truth is, I think a lot of people genuinely don't. And it startled, there was, I had a moment um, around Thanksgiving last year with some of Owen's family where they were talking about a woman who was a heroin addict and uh, she had evidently like been sleeping in the trunk of the car and somebody, it was like his grandparents' neighbor and his grandmother says something about how like they got her out just in time or something. And Owen's aunt said something like, too bad they didn't just leave her in there. And I had one of those moments where I'm so stunned by the coldness of a person that I just stare at them and genuinely don't know what to say because I'm so disgusted. And so I just looked at her without saying anything, thinking my own thoughts, not really considering what it looked like for me to just stare without speaking. And she saw my expression and began to get defensive and was like, I'm just saying I don't have any tolerance for drug addicts. And I just kept looking at her without re responding. And eventually somebody like chimed in and changed the subject. But I was so taken aback that I couldn't even formulate a response because sometimes it's enough to just let a person know, don't fucking talk like that in front of me and not get into the whole like conversation and argument. It's Thanksgiving. I don't want to have an, a, a, a conversation about addiction and how both of my parents were addicts and that this is a serious issue that you're being completely lacking in compassion. I don't want to do that right now. But as long as I gave you enough of a look to let you know that you better not fucking say anything like that in my hearing again, or you're getting this like, you're going to start some real shit. I guess that's enough. 
but I think back on it all the time and like the way that I maybe could have responded, but I just was so flabbergasted when somebody is that lost, in my opinion, that's the word, when they are that wrong, that they're like, I wish she had just died in that sense about a stranger. It's one thing, in my opinion, to be like, I wish she had just died if it was like your sister and you've been trying to help her decades and decades of this addiction. I can have sympathy for what you're personally going through because that's agonizing. Being related to a drug addict who is in the throes of their addiction is one of the most draining experiences like anybody can go through. But this is a stranger and just having that instinctive reaction of too bad she didn't just die. I, I genuinely couldn't formulate a place to start with talking to a person who is of that opinion. It was just a real like, so I appreciated that even here, Victor sees that she's fucked up, but she can't back down. And that was like the exact reaction that this woman had where she doubled down as well. And I just sort of stared at her and let it go and hope that she'll think about it. But I don't think she will. Victor at least is somewhat thoughtful. Um, so let's see, half an hour after we set out, our tram grinds to a halt outside a deserted low color industrial hub where thousands of workers should diverge from their early morning commute from the stacks to attend their functions. But now it's still as a cemetery. When we leave, life will return to the place. But after we plant the bombs we brought with us, after we destroy the manufacturing, won't all the men and women we intend to help be just as unemployed as those poor creatures in the tram station? If work is their reason for being, what happens when we take it away? I'd voice my concerns to Severo, but he's a driven arrow, as dogmatic as I once was, and to question him aloud seems a betrayal of our friendship. He's always trusted me blindly. So am I the worst friend for having doubts in him? Like I said, I get why he's feeling this, but I just really think Severo, he needs somebody to be in charge. He is not the in charge guy. He's not up for it. I don't, I don't see it. Uh, anyway, so my place is now beside Ragnar and Victra behind Severo as he spits out his gum and stalks forward, giving me a wink and an elbow in the side to stand in front of the small army, his army. He's tiny for an obsidian male, but still scarred and tattooed and terrifying to this company of small handed uh, garbage man and hunched tower welders. He tilts his head forward, eyes smoldering behind his black contacts, wolf tattoos looking evil against his pale skin in the industrial light. Greetings, grease monkeys. His voice rumbles low and predatory. You might be wondering why Ares has sent a pack of hardcore nasties like us to this tin shithole. We aren't here to cuddle. We aren't here to inspire you or give you long ass speeches like the bloody damn sovereign. We're here to blow shit up. He throws open his arms and cackles. Any questions? I got a few. But we'll wait. We'll wait and ask those questions next time but I don't like this. Let me be on record as saying, I don't like it. I get what he's doing, but there has to be a way to do this so that it fucks up everybody else and not the people that you're allegedly helping. But you know what? That's also how war works. So I, you know, what do I know? I don't fucking know. It's just very frustrating. Anyway, I got to wrap up. I'm over time as usual. Um, thank you guys again so much for hanging out with me. Thank you, Cassie, for commissioning this episode. Really appreciate you all. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.